Thank you. I'm going to introduce the next person. Claire Light is a Bay Area writer and cultural worker. She has worked since 1997 in nonprofit administration, particularly arts in the Asian American community. Her MFA in fiction came from San Francisco State University, and some of her fiction is published in McSweeney's, Hyphen, Farthing, and the Encyclopedia Project, amongst others. A short collection of her stories, slightly behind and to the left, was published by Aqueduct Press in 2009. She has taught writing to teens, college students, and adults, and occasionally blogs at the Nerds of Color, and on her own blog, clairelight.net. I always have to raise the mic, so I've gotten handy at it. Hi. Hello. Um, this is so great. Thank you, uh, Catherine, Amy, and, and all of the organizers. Um, and uh, thank you, Liz, for connecting me with these great folks. Uh, sorry we're late. I hope to connect more closely with all of you afterwards. Um, and thank you, um, Johanna, for the uh, amazing essay that got us all started. Um, I have a systemic illness that has no name and is barely even a concept yet in our fucked up Western medical establishment. My illness is that my immune system is overactive and attacks things it shouldn't. A lot of you will understand this. This has, uh, over the years, led to me coming down with nine supposedly distinct illnesses, um, most of them called autoimmune, three of which are debilitating and two of which, type 1 diabetes and Hashimoto's thyroiditis, I've had since childhood. What really puts me over the debilitating top, though, is the third one, chronic fatigue syndrome. CFS, which I've had for six years, um, and in fact, um, I came down with the very month my little book of stories came out. I, I have a few to sell out there if you want them in there. Um, they're covered by a handmade letterpress uh, book jackets made by a friend of mine. Um, the CFS put an end to my lifelong, mostly successful determination not to live as a sick person. Um, it has transformed my life in every particular, especially since CFS has cognitive implications as well as physical ones. Short-term memory impairment, loss of focus, brain fog. It makes it impossible for me to write or even read anything even remotely challenging during a flare-up. So since I became debilitated, I've been binge reading Paranormal Detective series. Uh, anybody reading Paranormal Detectives out there? I highly recommend it. Um, this is a subgenre of urban fantasy. You'll recognize it as the same genre as the TV shows Buffy the Vampire Slayer, True Blood, Supernatural, or Grimm, um, in which there is a supernaturally powered investigator tasked with patrolling the borders between mundane human life and the mythological realm. The heroine, and it's an overwhelmingly uh, woman-centered genre, usually has powers that include strength, speed, and rapid healing. And oh yes, this is wish fulfillment to the nth degree. <laughs> I forgot that I stapled this. How oh, annoying. Um, because I also can't write the spoon intensive literary way I used to write, which you can read in that book, um, writing a bog standard paranormal detective series from Outline uh, has been the only way for me to get back into writing, and I follow the genre trope for trope. Um, what bugs me about so much urban fantasy, though, is the overwhelming whiteness. It takes place always in a slightly disjointed version of our world, places like Atlanta, New York, or San Francisco, but there are never any people of color, except for one or two you know, um, tokens. So my own proposed series, starting with this nearly finished novel called Monkey, Monkey Around, features all characters of color from non-Western mythological traditions. The other thing I've added to the mix, and which is resoundingly my response to the sick woman theory question, of how to be active when you can't leave the house, is that these stories take place in my world, that is, the world of social justice activism in the Bay Area. Um, my protagonist is a social justice organizer in her human life and a leader of mythical creatures in her supernatural life. Um, if I can't live regularly in that world anymore, at least I can depict it, right? Um, and in such a way as to make its interest, courage, adventurousness, and pitfalls clear. 
So Monkey Around takes place um, July of 2013 against the backdrop of the George Zimmerman Trayvon Martin trial and subsequent protests. Our heroine, Maya, is a descendant of the Chinese Monkey King and is active in Asian American organizing. Her college crush, Tez, is a Nahual, who turns into a Jaguar, um, an IT professional and an erstwhile bilingual poetry slam champion. <laughs> as, as you are. Um, I've chosen this scene, which comes two-thirds of the way through the novel, because it is where Maya's separate human and supernatural worlds start to converge. Tez is in mourning for his little sister who has been murdered, presumably over possession of a magical walking stick that Tez now holds. Uh, the stick makes him giddy, unstable, and violent, but does very little to Maya, and yes, I'm aware of the foul implications. Um, to distract him from his grief and the stick, Maya has invited him to attend a Trayvon Martin rally in San Francisco. We agreed to walk since it was such a beautiful day, and since our heads were so full of things we'd agreed not to talk about, we walked in silence. But it was a comfortable silence, and since we were with each other, we didn't need to hide our ability to move fast. After a few blocks of his silent, manic grinning, though, I felt weird and offered to carry his backpack. He's carrying this, the magic stick in his backpack. Um, to my surprise, he agreed, although he had little a little trouble handing it over. I finally had to strike out like a snake and yank it from his grasp. But once it was away from him, he relaxed a little. It really does nothing for you, he asked, half suspicious, half chagrined. It's a little unpleasant. Well, it's not actually unpleasant. It's not strong enough to be unpleasant. It's more like stepping into a hot tub and realizing you've stepped into tepid jello instead. Except I'm sure you'd get used to the jello. I don't think I'd ever get used to this. And it doesn't bother you to carry it. The padding on the back of the backpack was thick enough, apparently, and I was able to carry it comfortably. By now, the stick was small enough that its contours couldn't be seen in the shape of the bag. Hmm, I made magic sticks shrink. No wonder my love life sucked. <laughs> We power walked nearly the length of Potrero Avenue in about three minutes, then cut over to, t to 10th Street and made it to Market and Powell in another five. It was refreshing. I rarely moved fast in the light. People pay too much attention to a young woman walking alone. But with Tess beside me, the world thought I had an excuse to exist, and no one seemed to notice our speed. I noticed Tess tensing as we approached the small but vocal crowd blocking the cable car turnaround on Market. We were a little late. I was the point person for our group, so I usually made a point to get there first. But I wasn't too worried. Our core group knew their business by now. People were already wandering around with Asian, Asian Americans for, for racial justice and Asian solidarity with Trayvon and the like over their heads. I silently admired the lettering, my own work mostly, but who's counting? <laughs> there were also costumes and giant puppets and freaks flying their freak flags all the usual accoutrement of San Francisco marches, and lots of people that maybe Tez didn't know. It suddenly occurred to me that maybe Tez wasn't a protest marching type. You been to a march before? I asked anxiously. He snorted, are you kidding me? I was practically weaned on marches. I think my first one was a stoop labor rally my parents took me to when I was a baby. My mom almost got fired for trying to bring the janitorial service where she worked into SEIU Local 87. Did she succeed? I asked, dazzled all over again. She was the rep until she got sick, he said proudly, which is floating, uh, flirting among uh, activists. Um, <laughs> baby ran up to us. Wow, my, you're late. She didn't sound accusing, though. Rather, glad to see me. Considering how we left each other last time, um, they'd had a huge fight over um, fundraising ethics. Um, not kidding, this actually happens in the book. Um, I was pretty sure the enthusiasm wasn't about me. And sure enough, Baby's eyes cut right over to Tez after greeting me. To avoid deep embarrassment, I hurried to introduce him. Tez is his baby, Baby Tez. Tez, Baby cried, giving him a hug. I feel like I know you already. Tez froze. I plotted murder. She saw the look on his face. Didn't Maya tell you? We used to go to the poetry slams all the time. Man, you were on. Fire. She knuckled him in the arm with her fist. Tez looked uncomfortable, but relaxed a little bit. I decided to hold off on the murdering. Thanks, he said. Listen, Baby said, taking his hand. Only Baby could get away with this. I'd offer you condolences, but I can tell you don't want them, not from strangers. 
but I'm hereby relieving you of any social responsibilities for the afternoon. You can hang out as long as you like, leave when you like, talk or be silent as you like, and make no apologies. I got your back. With a final squeeze, they let go of his, she let go of his hand and made good on her promise. I knew that for the rest of the day, she'd be keeping an eye on him and cock blocking anyone's attempts to get anything from him he didn't want to give. He was being babied. He looked a little shocked, but also relieved. She's like the anti-Maya, he said, smiling. I chose not to take it amiss. She does make me possible, I said. He laughed, not a giddy laugh, but a genuine one. I introduced him to the rest of my crowd, including Mari and about half of the staff of Inscrutable, plus about half the crowd. Inscrutable's a, a magazine that she, she started with, uh, with a group of people, sort of political magazine. Uh, yes, I know everyone. I'm a networker. What can I say? Monkeys are social creatures. Tess was friendly, but not particularly open, and that appeared to be okay with everyone. A few people recognized him from poetry slams of yore. Everyone else seemed to regard him with a certain amount of awe. It gave me a new perspective on Tez. I had always thought that the awe he engendered was poetry specific. Plus, it had never seemed overblown to me, given how much awe I held him in. But most of the folks here didn't even know him. Yet, as he walked around, I saw how people turned to look at him and even unconsciously moved closer to him. Was it the Nopal? Was it the Styx proximity? Or was it Tez himself? Was he just born with this much charisma? So I'm going to stop there. I know it's a super short um, excerpt. <laughs>